some of you know. Kim is editor of Garden Organics magazine, Organic Way. She runs her own organic courses. She lives in Wales, which means she knows all about the weather. And with Sally Morgan, who I think actually is with us, if so, hello. Uh, she co-authored the book, The Climate Change Garden, and is uh, fast becoming our kind of homegrown climate change gardening guru, which is brilliant because she's really getting, getting it out and about. I only just wanted to set up the big picture. Um, the new revolution in gardening, which is what Kim and I both share, and Garden Organic and our club, the Biodynamic Garden Club, is all about bringing nature back center stage. It's about bringing nature and well being for us, our gardens, and our planet right center stage. It's about having masses of bees and masses of flowers and having a pond and uh, <clears throat> and having super healthy soils and food and and growing more fruit and and creating little havens of 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 what you know little havens for wildlife it it's that is what it's about and it's about gardening in as many climate friendly ways as we can which is exactly um what this evening, uh, what this evening webinar is, is going to be about. But I think for me, the interesting thing is actually, it's much more about a mindset because without wishing to steal Kim's thunder, most of the things that she's going to be talking about is kind of what we do anyway. It's just a question of having that focus. So over to you, Kim, I've had my say. Thank you very much, that's great. Um, before I get started and um, go through a series of slides to, um, to help steer me in terms of um, what I'm gonna be talking about this evening, because it is such a, a massively wide area as well, so I can get a bit carried away, so it's to help me focus. Um, just given where we, we are now with lockdown, with, with the pandemic, um, I just wanted to, um, really just bring alive as much as possible just the love for homegrown food and to, you know to have a few props here as well just to make it more interactive I've been making myself go outside every day um, whatever the weather to um, to pick some herbs um, to pick some carrots just to have that connection because at the moment we have this massive disconnect um, because we have to um, but it's um, it's more important than ever just to tune into the natural world. And as Linda was saying, you know, with biodynamics, um, it's really all about working with nature. This is, this is a book, the Maria Tan Biodynamic Gardening Calendar that I, um, I rigorously refer to because it's brilliant. I've done tests before. I've tried planting on days that aren't actually um, supposed to be planted on. And I've, you know, I've really noticed difference. So, it, you know, it's very great for me to be here so supportive about the, um, the club and what they do. And I'm gonna be doing some more trials with um, the organization throughout the year as well. So I can learn more about biodynamics because that's the thing with gardening, you are constantly learning. I think anyone that says they're a complete expert mm -hmm. and know everything, um, it, it's, just, it's just not true. You know, it's, that's part of the fun of gardening um, is that you're constantly finding new ways of doing things. And with climate change, it's very much no longer gardening as usual. So the more that we can actually look, touch, feel, connect, um, and use our, our nature-based intuition, because nature does hold all of the answers, the more we can tune into that and build resilience in ourselves as gardeners, um, throwing away the rule book, if we need to and thinking, no, this, this, this makes more sense to me, my own individual gardening space, the better that will actually be as well. So I'm just gonna put some slides up as well to help me focus, because obviously it's a subject that I'm very, very passionate about. And I want to allow plenty of time at the end as well for questions, because that's the really fun bit as well. So I can just really interact with you all more. So I'm just going to share the presentation here. There we go. So how to be a climate change savvy gardener, and it is very much about inside and out. And I think um, there are lots of techniques and things that you can do. Um, when Sally and I were researching the book, we looked around the world for inspiration. We looked to the past, we looked to the present, 
we look to ideas for the future and the more that we as human beings can connect and share ideas and form this community the better that very much is um because we are all we're all in this together um and we're you know we're facing unprecedented challenges at the moment so the more that we can connect and help each other the better that is um, my own gardens um, in West Wales, um, I'm 700 foot above sea level um, in a very wild, windy part of, of beautiful West Wales, um, beautiful place, very sort of nature friendly anyway, but I've created a haven, but my gardens flooded um, and the, the reason they flooded really brings alive um, some of the issues with climate change and why our gardens are so potentially susceptible to extremes of weather. So what happened is um, I live in um, sort of surrounded by farmers and one of my farming neighbours um, ploughed a field. It's a very steep field at the back of the garden and before it was used for grazing. So there was grass and grass is able to hold and retain water to a greater extent. But once the field um, and soil was ploughed over, all the natural microbial activity that the natural infrastructure, soil structure below ground was, was diminished. Um, therefore, there's a lot of rain. The water came flooding down, the gardens flooded. So that, this was about was eight, nine years ago, and it really led me onto this journey of just finding out more what I could do to actually shore up the defences. I've always gardened organically. Um, you know, I, I first got into gardening so, so apparently, according to my mum, I was a very moody teenager. I don't remember being moody, but apparently I was. But, um, but you know, for me, there was a connection with the natural world. Um, I just remember being mesmerized by seeing um, a spider's web and a load of, um, you know, baby spiders hatching out and crawling over the web and just feeling this amazing connection and feeling mesmerized by the natural world. Um, randomly sowed some carrot seed in the back of my mom's garden, her parents' garden, and just amazed as you know, without doing anything or knowing what I was doing, um, they just germinated and I was able to harvest loads of carrots. So that excitement that I felt back then a long time ago, I still feel today. Um, but with, um, there's lots of techniques um, that you can do with regards to climate change. Only, we obviously only have about 35 minutes here. So I'm gonna go through some of the key areas. But with um, my actual gardens as well, as I say, and with all of this, it's very much about working with nature. The challenges with climate change, um, when I used to do talks to gardening clubs about climate change, I used to have to try and persuade people it was happening. Um, I don't really feel I have to do that right now. Um, but, you know, I mean, we've obviously flooding this week, greater extremes of weather. You know, when the idea of climate change, um, you know, we were first told it was happening. Um, you know, the, the idea was sold to us that we'd probably have more Mediterranean like summers would be able to grow more Mediterranean crops. And actually in a way, the way it's positioned actually made it sound quite attractive. The truth of the matter, and this has been happening for quite a long time now, and it's increasingly happening, is that we're looking at extremes of weather. So what happens is that you can have um, obviously floods as we're experiencing this week, there's more rain, um, heat waves, um, you know, it's, it's unprecedented periods of extremes. And the thing with that is that although your plants um, that, you know, they can be challenged, some plants, perennials, might look like they're, they're faring really well against, let's say, a, pro a prolonged period of sunshine, which is quite a nice thing to be thinking about on a very cold, wet evening in January. But, you know, what will then happen is that if you then get another extreme afterwards, immediately afterwards, then it just takes its toll, it can cause weakness. There's more risks of pests and disease. Um, you know, pests can be overwintered, um, different threats coming in and so on and so forth. So it's no longer gardening as usual. And I love what Linda was saying about the gardening revolution. I think that's really nice. Um, so, you know, variety struggle, uh, you know, it's this idea of this primped and polished garden that, you know, a lot of people have seen as being the, very much the gold standard. And over winter, as well, the, um, the risk of nutrient leach away is massive. So the, you know, this, um, you know, again, for, you know, some sort of traditional communities, this idea of turning over the soil um, at the end of the season, bedding down the outside veg patch, such the worst thing you can do, you're leaving the soil really vulnerable to, to you know, an excess of rain, this is my impersonation of rain here, 
Um, and, you know, washing those, those nutrients away, which you need very much, obviously, you know, you work hard to make the soil the best it can be, because it's the heart and soul of um, organic gardening system. So lots of challenges there, but again, it's, you know, nature, 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 which is very much part of biodynamic gardening anyway. Um, homegrown is just more important than ever. Um, again, I know I'm speaking to a, a sort of captive audience with regards to this, but it's just the, I mean, how does it make you feel? How, how it makes me feel germinating, um, in this case, pea shoots I've got here, germinating a seed taking a seed, a little, this little capsule that wants to grow, it wants to turn into a plant, germinating it into a plant that then transforms into food that you can, you can feed yourself with. You're nurturing the soul as much as you are your stomach. It's, it's magical, it's mesmerizing, it provides connection. Personally, with the challenges of lockdown, I've been doing lots of growing inside um, on the windowsill. I've been doing lots of seed germination, just again to you know, to have that connection, because it's very hard at the moment. We're all in a bit of a state of fight or flight with everything that's happening. So the more that you can connect, the more that you can just stick your hands in the soil, even if it's on your windowsill, the better that will make you feel. Um, and there's been loads of research done as well, increasingly about the benefits of actually touching the soil, the microbial activity in the soil. There's you know, there's links there with healthy immune system, healthy, you know, microbial activity, immune system, health of soil. So it's a fascinating area that we're kind of really, I suppose, very much at the tip of the iceberg of learning, of learning about. So highly recommended. Um, so, so many reasons, no plastic, um, you know, from, from plot to plate and so on and so forth. And the flavour is just, you know, you just can't compare it to shop ball. Nature, um, nice excuse here. Um, you know, to have a picture of frog in lettuce, but we, you know, we can learn so much from the natural world. So often we try traditionally to overcomplicate things. If you look at, for example, um, the instructions on the average seed packet, it's, you know, it can put a lot of people off, you know, very exacting instructions, plant to a certain depth, plant at exactly this time of year, um, you know, and it can make you, it can make your head reel with the, you know, the exacting nature of this. But again, the more that we can just think, what do we think? You know, how do I, how do I feel I should do this and have that connection, build confidence in you as a gardener, the better that is. It gives you um, an innate understanding of, of ways of doing things and that it's connecting, it's all, I'm gonna keep using the word connection this evening, so apologize in advance, but it's just so, so important because we're living in times of such disconnect. So to stop meticulously controlling our gardens and, you know, allow nature in, um, you know, I mean, there's still this preconceived idea, although it is dissipating, thankfully, um, you know, there's, there's been more talk around the benefits of weeds and the benefits of, of, you know, biodiversity, but there's still this idea that, uh, a picture perfect um, plot shouldn't, you know, it should look a certain way. I'm going to be talking about mixed planting in a bit as well, because that's very much part of my own individual approach with, um, with climate change gardening. And this is, um, this is an image here. I don't know how closely you can see it on the slide, but it's um, Day Males, um, most immaculate garden of the UK. It's from a couple of years ago, and there's a couple there. And, you know, they look really proud and happy with their undoubtedly very, very immaculate garden. But the thing with that is that you're controlling nature, you are putting nature in its place and you're fighting, fighting against plants that want to germinate, anything else coming in. And, you know, your space becomes much needier as a result. So things like using fertilizers, um, you know, it's much more vulnerable to the elements because you are trying to keep things so carefully controlled. And the thing with biodynamics, well, is that, you know, gardening by the moon is, it's, you know, this isn't anything new. This is innate old knowledge. You know, this is, this is um, you know, it has a lot of history and depth. And actually, if you look to the, um, the peasant and worker gardens, the, um, the, you know, the medieval gardens, they actually employed a much more nature friendly way of doing things. I've got a picture here of, um, it's a peasant garden at Wildon Down the Museum. There's a really nice example at St Faggins, um, just outside Cardiff as well. And 
you know, the, the, the average peasant worker garden, garden that will gardener, they're busy, they're working, they're workers. Um, they didn't have time to, to prim from polish, to spend 35 hours a week, whatever it was, the, the daily mail couple are spending on their garden. They need a garden that is productive, that works for itself, and they worked with nature. So they had a much more biodiverse space because um, it's attracting in pollinators. There was lots of self-seeding plants. They were eating weeds, weeds like fat hen, um, which was you know, quite widely um, eaten you know, at the time. It's, it's edible. Um, it was used quite widely before brassicas came into prominence. And it's the ultimate, again, in low maintenance gardening. It's, um, it's mixed planting. It's allowing nature to, um, to work in harmony. And with wildlife as well, you know, the more biodiverse space you have, then the, the so-called pest simply becomes food for something else. So it kind of, you know, it's again, it's permaculture. It takes this idea of, you know, what is a pest? What is, you know, what is a creature? Slugs, even slugs, have purpose because they're food for something else. A wasp, you know, I've seen wasps um, hoover up aphids. I've seen wasps um, do so many amazing things. They pollinate plants. You know, everything has its place. Everything has its place. And actually what I experienced a few years ago, um, there was a, a drought um, in 2018. Again, let's think about sunshine. Let's think about sunshine in January. Um, you know, there was a drought um, and it, uh, there, uh, there was no rain for about six weeks. I have a private water supply and it ran almost completely dry, which is obviously quite stressful. But the plus side, the silver lining of that was that it enabled me to take these tactics that I've been teaching and talking about and writing about in the press and to, to really push them to the limit. So the plants um, are having the polytunnels. I was only able to water them once a week. And outside, um, everything just had to pretty much make do. Um, so, but what I'd found um, the following year, talking about pests, is that I found that some of the perennials in the polytunnels actually had um, some green fly on them. So I thought, okay, well, let's, let's see what happens. That's the first time that's, that's actually been an issue. And I left it a week or so, and I saw there was masses of ladybird larvae, because I let things like nettles grow in the polytunnels. I have lots of bronze fennel, all of which are great for, um, for ladybirds and lacewings. And again, you know, nature sorted it out, nature came to the rescue. So again, that's all about not very carefully, meticulously controlling things. Perennials, um, absolutely fantastic. I'm gonna show you a trick with perennials a bit later on, because it's not just about using perennials that you would think are traditionally perennials. There's some tricks that you can try, but very much um, at the heart of this approach is looking to old knowledge. You know, there's nothing, there's nothing new in this at all. Um, these, these ideas, these sort of gold standard ideas of how we should be doing things are actually Victorian. Effectively, they're based on Victorian country house state principles of gardening. Um, if you look back before then, this was a much more nature friendly way of doing things. So we need to look to the past to learn for the future. Um, in terms of flooding, obviously very relevant for, for what's happening right now. My garden flooded, so um, just some of the things that I've done with this is at the back of the garden, where the water was actually running through, lots of planting, so trees and shrubs, allowing the grass to grow longer, which is great for wildlife anyway, creates ground cover, and you know, every time I, during the summer, I go to, I mow pathways around the long, long grass areas. Um, and every time, if I think I might just, you know, deviate slightly or widen the pathway, I might see a, probably a moth or a butterfly. And it just reminds me that no, actually, this is an amazing habitat for wildlife. So I should keep that, but it is really good for helping to soak up water. Um, also, I use willow. As well, I use willow as another barrier, which is also very good for strong winds. Say so I live 700 foot above sea level, so it's a very windy spot. And um, you know, gravel pathways on this particular patch are good for me because it enables me to have an all weather space all year round. Because I use a porous membrane with gravel, which enables the water to to, to flow away. So again, it's this permaculture idea of slow it, spread it, sink it, effectively. Um, and just trying to 
to allow that water to have somewhere to go. If everybody in an urban area um, were to put out um, some water butts or some kind of bins, some kind of container in their back garden during strong rain, you know, like we've had this week, it's going to help make a difference. Because the thing is, um, you, you know, it's again, back to the slow it, spread it, sink it. It's just trying to slow that movement down and work with it. Not trying to fight it, trying to work with it. And in urban areas, you have a lot of, um, you know, concrete and these sort of non-porous surfaces as well, which can cause issues with this. Speaking about, this isn't flooding related, um, but this is um, another thing as well to feed in, is that because I live so high up, um, in a very wild and windy spot. I was told that I couldn't grow fruit trees at all um, when I first moved here. I mentioned it to a few people and I got sharp intake of breath and a, you know, a sort of shake of the head or oh, no, 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 you can't do that, which automatically makes me want to do it. Um, so, and actually, yes, you can. Um, you just use um, an exposed spot, damsons, um, down the, um, in my case, the westerly side, so to provide um, basically protection. And then now I'm able to grow, I, I've got a lot of um, apple trees, um, pear trees, and you know, they've massively flourished and grown. So there are ways of doing things. Again, layering, if you sort of think forest garden as well, think forest garden, think layers, um, different structures, you know, it's really good for, for just helping to provide that sort of protection. Um, the other thing that I did in my own individual patch for the sort of growing that I do is to have raised beds um, because that helps to, to lift the plant roots up above the ground so that um, if there's, you know, if there's flooding, then they're not going to um, obviously be affected. They can still sort of thrive. Um, perennial planting, the, you know, their roots spread far and wide um, beneath the ground. They are much more resilient against an excess of water, but also an excess of drought as well. Not digging, massively important, hugely, hugely important. Um, you know, and it's great that Charles Dowding's done so much around this because before, you know, it before it was one of those subjects that, you know, there were some people talking about it, but now it's come to much greater provenance and it's so important. So it's the tip of the iceberg in terms of what we understand about what happens underground. It's a whole ecosystem. You've got mycorrhizal fungi helping plant roots to, um, to find food and water. You've got these, these heroes of the soil all working together, plants that have symbiotic relationships underground. And the, the soil's ability to hold and retain water is greatly diminished when you turn it over. What I started doing is another idea, and this is, this is a recent thing in the last year, is when I, um, I, you know, if it's a plant that, um, say if it's a tomato plant at the end of the season, rather than um, once the plant has finished producing and taking it out the ground, I will just cut it off at the root. Um, over winter, I let lots of plants actually just die down in the ground because if you think about it, sometimes you probably see, when you take a plant out the ground, you see the mycorrhizal fungi around the roots and, you know, if you take it out of the ground, you're, you're taking this valuable, amazing, um, you know, potent um, source of, of support and all these other things for your other plants out of the soil. So I now leave that in the ground as much as possible and just try not to disturb things. Compost, um, massively important. Um, you know, make your own compost if you can. And, you know, ground cover. Again, during the, um, the summer months, I just try and make the best use of any space. So I'm going to talk a bit about mixed planting. So there's, there's a lot of information here. So um, these slides are very much to help me focus. So uh, these are the key points, but ground cover is incredibly useful thing to do as well. There's a video here on building resilience with regards to watering. Um, I don't know if it's a link that could be sent out afterwards, or if you go to the Garden Organic um, YouTube channel, you can access it through there as well. But I just thought I'd mention that because that's a, a big topic in itself. Not so pertinent, obviously, at this time of year because we have an excess of rain. Um, but your soil, again, you know, biodynamics, across organic gardening, the heart and soul of your garden. Every time I run a course, when I, I can do so in person, um, I just try and, if, unless someone's got a skin condition, just try and get them connected with the soil as well. It just makes you feel so incredibly good and it gives you such a greater understanding of where your plants are. 
So things like if it's early in the season with um, seedlings, when they're, when they're ready to be planted out, you can see there's a, a shoot coming out here, you know, to look and to get connected and to see. Um, but also with regards to watering, um, with peat-free composts, um, with compost, you know, it's, it's just good to actually put your fingers in the soil and just to see, you know, does it, sometimes it can look wet on the top and be dry underneath and vice versa. But if you actually put your fingers in, that's a surefire way of knowing whether you actually need to water or not. So it's all about having a look and um, getting, getting muddy fingers wherever you can, which feels really good. Um, yeah, definitely not digging over winter, put it away. Um, mixed planting, um, this is one of the, the best things I discovered during my course of um, experimentation. I did a lot of experimentation in particular with my gardening for free blog that I did for The Guardian. So I completely immersed myself into the world of seed saving because I couldn't buy anything. This experiment to see if I could not buy anything at all. Mixed planting came about um, through this, this massive flurry of experimentation. I experiment still now because I think it's incredibly important, but I don't know about you, but for me, um, with crop rotation, which is, is used for a purpose, you know, crop rotation, you don't want the soil to build up um, with certain, you know, issues or disease, you know, it's all about keeping the, the fertility and so on and so forth. And it works for an organic system, but um, this is much more about replicating nature. And I used to, because I've got a third of an acre plot in my training gardens, it used to make my head reel because I'd have very exacting crop rotation plans as you're supposed to. Um, you know, this follows this and different people say different things. And it just all felt so formulaic and actually really quite restrictive. And so I just started experimenting. I figured that if I have different plants of the same family sufficiently spread apart um, and different, you know, different types of plant mixed in between, I'm not draining the soil of um, particular nutrients. There's, you know, there's a biodiversity going on there um, and it makes a lot of sense all around. Um, then I learned that was called polyculture. Um, I, you know, again, it's purely experimentation, didn't realize it was a thing. Um, a bit like forest gardening as well. There's an element of that to it. But if you imagine, if you had a big block of carrots, um, you know, uh, together, it's, it's much easier for, um, you know, the nemesis for carrots in particular is carrot fly. It's much easy, easier for carrot fly to find the way in because they can smell the foliage. Um, and if, but it, you know, if you look at the idea of companion planting, it's a bit like that on a much bigger scale. So it's much more free spirited, it's much more mix and match, but it's harder for creatures that want to nibble um, or cause um, havoc to said plants to actually find their way in because you've got these different layers of plants, a bit again, say like a forest gardening idea. It's much more naturalistic and it works really well. It's massively low maintenance as well. I allow lots of things to self seed. Um, I, you know, I use lots of different tricks. I cut things to the ground. I use ground cover. I just put lots of things like lettuce and herbs in between other plants which, you know, in, in the height of the summer, it's, um, it's providing protection for the soil, it works over winter, and it's fun. It's fun. I like bright coloured flowers. Um, I like bright coloured things. So for me, it brings a smile to my face to see lots of things like calendula, feed with you. I've got these beautiful um, opium poppies that have just moved in. Uh, Welsh poppies, you know, agrilegia. There's all these different wild flowers that have just moved in and I just allow them to, to shoot up foxgloves. Um, it's just beautiful. You know, you've got loads of produce and a splash of color in between. So that works really well for me. And again, you know, I think it's about finding a way of gardening that works for you. So not feeling you have to do things in a formulaic way, connecting with your outside space, connecting with yourself as an individual and what you like. What, what do you like? Do you like certain colors? You know, how, how do you feel about this? And I think, you know, areas, seating areas as much as possible where you can enjoy the space, very, very important. It's not just about the so-called hard work of gardening. It's about having the opportunity to really connect with your space, to 
to, you know, to tune in to a particular raised bed or a particular area and look at how alive that is. Because a garden that's um, gardened in this way is alive with, um, with wildlife. And it's, um, it's food, you know, it's food for the table if it's an edible garden, but it's food for the soul as well. I think that gardening connection with nature is in our DNA. I think that it's embedded within all of us as individuals. And I think that the more that we can actually tap into that, the better we actually feel. I've done loads of therapeutic gardening work over the years with people with autism. And it's just, I believe this more than ever. Um, and you know, it's really come into its own with everything that's happened during the pandemic. Um, I'm aware of time to allow enough questions. So just another picture here of mixed planting as well. You can see lots of, um, hedging, um, I use sort of spent um, branches, I created a natural hedge there, which is, is great for wildlife, very naturalistic. Now, here's the thing I want to share as well, is that, you know, perennials, you think of the classic perennials, you can have things like um, oak, Jerusalem, artichoke, rhubarb and so forth, but you can actually turn certain, um, certain brassicas perennial. So this is something I just learned again through sheer experimentation. Um, it works particularly well with um, kale, shard and purple sprouting broccoli. Actually, I wouldn't include sprout on there. You can do sprout, but it's more for leaves. But they can, they can grow on for a good few years. You just need to cut them back, allow them to, um, to fruit. You know, in the case of purple sprouting broccoli, that's one plant in the picture. So it's like having a few plants in one bumper harvests, um, then what they will do is, you know, you cut them back, they will harvest again, uh, produce again, and then they will flower. It's their natural instinct to flower and set seed. Allow them to flower because it's amazing for pollinators. Early in the year, it's a really good way of drawing pollinators onto your, onto your plot. Um, and then just cut them back and they can keep going. If it's inside, they can go on for several years. If it's outside, they can go on for a good few years and it's a great thing to do. Seed saving, oh, there's a whole webinar on seed saving. Just seed save as much as you can. Um, it, you know, the adaption over time, these seeds, these little amazing capsules will become much more adapted to your individual growing space. So, um, you know, you can't, you can't put a price on that. It's one of the most empowering things you can do. Again, this idea of building resilience in the gardener to actually save some of, oh, look, I've got prop, to save some of your own seed um, just makes you feel so incredibly good and it completes the natural gardening circle in a way that's really special again people people used to do this there's nothing new about it um, it feels great wildlife 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 each and every opportunity there's so much you can do you know allow allow areas to grow wild and you can build a pond um, you know even a small tub in the ground but you know allow deadwood on trees feed the birds, allow wildflowers in, and don't bed the, the garden down for winter. Um, just work with the natural world and let it in, let it in for greater resilience effectively, which is, you know, it's very much at the heart of the, um, the biodynamic approach. Um, and then finally, because I'm aware of needing time for questions, um, yeah, it's just a special offer on the, the Climate Change Garden book this evening as well. So um, it's normally 16.99 but um, we're offering it for £13, including posting packaging. And there's a code there, which is um, CCG13 through the website. But that, that's all from me. I'm just now keen to answer your questions. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. Um, uh, Jess, can you bring me back? <laughs> can you zoom me back? Uh, difficult act to follow. Interestingly enough, I've just twigged, I literally have the perfect climate change garden. <laughs> because everything that Kim has just talked about, and Kim and I have not talked about this, by the way, I don't have a single square of, of uh, bare soil in my garden ever. And most of that is literally, is, is I, I just kind of let the plants do their thing. And it never occurred to me before I never have to worry when the sun is beating down or when the rain is beating down because the I never really notice my garden is so naturally resilient and it isn't anything I've done. So 
Thank you for that, Kim. I myself was probably expecting more, shall we say, the conventional, and I'm so pleased that you've yeah. done what you've done. And the other thing I'm really pleased about, I don't know about the people who are here, but I'm guessing most of us have got um, a small or a big garden, but climate change gardening and the kind of gardening revolution that we are talking about applies just as much in an urban setting. It oh. really does. I love the fact that all of us can get that feeling from nature literally by growing a few, a few seeds on our windowsill. We can all have a pot of something and it really can kind of change your life. Right, uh, we're going to get down to questions now. One from Melissa, um, uh, who wants creative tips from the club and Kim, thank God, on types of coverings for the soil over winter. It can equate to a lot of mulch. That's probably that question which made me understand that I actually don't have any bare soil. The reason for that is I've got a lot of wild geraniums and they just keep self-seeding. So they provide a ground cover. And, and I never ever, I've, ne I've lived here eight years and I've never mown the grass once. So there's not a lot of grass left. But, but Kim, if you have got a lot of bare soil, where would you point people in the direction of, of covering it over winter? Um, there's different ways of going about it and I'm very much of the opinion that you should do um, what works for you. Yeah. Um, so there's, um, you know, there's different techniques. I mean, the thing is, there's lots of different techniques and different ways of doing things. But what I try and do is simplify things as much as possible. And then it's, you know, by making it accessible, then you can experiment with wider methods. But I mean, leaf leaves. Um, you know, um, fantastic resource, great for soil structure. So, um, you know, they obviously in ample supply uh, in, in autumn and winter, you know, free supply from the ground. You know, you can, you know, just sprinkle leaves um, over the ground. I mean, you know, there's things like green manures that you can do. Personally, I don't really like using green manures. I've used them myself, but um, you know, that is another option as well to provide cover. You can also just allow some weeds to grow. So what I would do um, is I would leave some crops in the ground myself personally, um, but if you allow, you know, if you have a bare area of ground, you're gonna get some weeds growing in because again, nature will find its way. As long as it's something that's not evasive, that's going to cause a problem, allowing some of them to grow is actually very useful because the roots will help to, for example, instead of grass, help to bind the soil together to provide that sort of structure. But as much as possible, I would recommend um, trying to keep things in the ground and to mix in lots of perennials. Again, this idea, not this idea of you finish planting, you've, you know, you've whipped all the produce out the ground um, and there's the, the sort of the bare patch of ground. So, um, but also you can cover it as well, so you can cover it, um, you know, to, to provide protection. It's different things you could do, but as much as possible, I would say try and have things um, growing in there. I mean, things like seed heads are fantastic food for, obviously for birds over winter. And then you've also got, there's a habitat, it's habitat for wildlife as well. So as much as possible, I would try and avoid it. But if you have it, then um, say, you know, try and cover it with things like leaves or, you know, provide some kind of natural protection, um, which will be improving soil at the same time. Uh, interestingly, Melissa says, uh, or from Sally saying, collect as many leaves in autumn. And, and that's oh, what yeah. I do. I, I've got a lot of trees. I've got a tiny garden, but I've got a lot of trees and I just chuck the leaves and, and they cover in winter. And then somehow magically in spring, they, they've gone. Um, what I actually- I want find... to say actually as well, on the subject of, um, of leaves as well, leaf mold, um, yeah. you can use it as a fantastic seed compost. Um, I did this when I was gardening for free, um, I did this and there are, um, there's the common advice out there that if you're going to use leaf mould um, for, for seed compost, you need to mix it with a percentage of this, a percentage of that. So I tried 100% leaf mould and found it, it worked really well, actually. You can also, if you have um, moles, um, you know, the, 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 the molehills, the soil is actually really lovely and broken up and that's quite nice to mix in. 
But the other thing as well with, um, you know, uh, Soil Association, um, the Innovative Farmers Programme, they've done experimentations with um, uh, wood chip. And it does take quite a few years, but wood chip over time, I think it's about four, four years. Um, so you do need to have space to work with this, but that can make a really good seed compost as well, just on the subject of leaves. Um, I'm going to encourage absolutely everybody to keep their eyes glued to the chat because thank you everybody because we are getting some great suggestions here. Um, alpine strawberries work in Anne's garden. I agree. I've got alpine strawberries and they, they, they go everywhere. Uh, oh, sweet woodruff. You have to have the little sweet woodruff. It's the best ground cover ever. And it has these beautiful little white flowers in, in spring. Um, and the sea of forget-me-nots, of course, they, they do it. They absolutely do it. Now, I've got a couple of questions, please, uh, Kim. Yes. Why do you like green manure? And somebody's saying uh, they grow phacelia. So do I. They are the best mm -hmm. bee plant ever. So I don't grow them as a green manure, I just grow them for, for the bees. Yeah, and yeah, then please. somebody, uh, Angela, Angela Gray, said that they grew tomatoes, courgettes, broccoli and kale last summer. They're still green, so she was wondering whether she should cut them down to soil level or just let them rot down. So why don't you use green manure and what to do about Angela's tomatoes and courgettes? <laughs> Which one first? That's the question, isn't it? Um, just with green manures, again, it's personal preference, isn't it? For me, um, I just keep a lot of things in the ground because I have this, it's a bit, it's a bit like a forest garden approach that I have a lot of perennials growing. I let a lot of things like bronze fennel grow and over winter, things like fever view, I have a lot of things that grow back. I have herbs mixed in with produce. Um, so for me, um, I don't have a clear space. For the green manure so it'd be kind of fitting it in between other things so it doesn't probably that's the main reason why I don't use it I mean there are sound principles for using it in terms of um, the you know the green crops um, you know there's different again it's I've, I've let some things rot down and actually you know there's um, you can you can dig a trench and you can just put compost in cover it over and allow that to, to break down there's different things you can do so try it experiment you know, it depends, again, everyone's growing space is individual. So, you know, we're all living in different parts of the country and we have our own eco-climate where we're living. So um, it's worth trying different things out because what works for one person somewhere won't work elsewhere. I certainly do not have plants like that that are still green um, because where I live, it's very wet um, and cold and windy, but beautiful. Um, but so, yeah, it's, it's worth trying. I mean, the reason that I first got into um, the whole idea of mixed planting, um, I mentioned about, you know, finding crop rotation, a bit of a headache, but I've, I've got a couple of polytunnels and um, I had, um, you know, rows of tomato plants and I have blight. Um, you know, there, there is blight um, sort of in, in the facility. And what happened is I saw how the blight, the, the spores pass from plant to plant to plant, despite using lots of techniques that are supposed to help with that, I realized that because they're so close together, it was so easy for them to move, the airborne spores to, you know, to move from plant to plant to plant. And I realized how vulnerable they were as a result of that. Um, and that just made me think that I wanted to have a much more free spirited way of doing things. And, you know, as long as you have, if you have sufficient distance against plants from the same family, that makes a massive difference. And I did a trial this year with, I did, um, I really had to force myself to do this. I had block planted potatoes. I had to really make myself, um, you know, block planted potatoes in one bed. In another, I had um, the usual potatoes mixed in with lots of other plants. And, um, you know, the block planted potatoes got blight, the others didn't. So it's just, yeah, it's, it's finding a way of doing it that works for you. And that's about experimenting. So I think, you know, um, as much as you can, maybe try one method and try something else alongside it. And it's, um, it's, it's, it's really, it's good to do that as well. It, again, sort of that innate knowledge, it kind of feeds it. So you can work out how you feel about things for yourself. I think, would I be right, uh, 
can, the big thing about climate change gardening is building resilience into your garden. Yes. And kind of what I'm getting is in order to build resilience into your garden, you've almost got to build resilience into your yourself. Or, yes. uh, and, and the way to do that is to have the confidence yes. to experiment. The way to do that is to understand that you and your garden are unique and and therefore you don't have it, it won't necessarily fail uh, in fact it won't fail if you don't do it by the book it's 100 percent so it's um we we live in a world um i mean i know that obviously i'm speaking to a very like-minded audience but predominantly we live in a world where we're taught to be reliant on things so there's a strong degree of reliance um and this idea that new is better than old um that you know each season because we're worth it you know, materialism, this idea of buying new things in and replacing and actually things like just fixing, fixing a spade um, or just taking a pair of secateurs and oiling them and sharpening them. You know, that type of thing, you're working with something, you have a connection with it that could last you a lifetime. Um, you could even name them. Um, you know, there's, you know, again, make it your own. Um, you know, there's that sense of, you um, Sorry, I keep saying it, connection, but also that sense of empowerment, definitely empowerment, um, yeah. in that you can do this, you can do it for yourself. I mean, I, I'm from Brighton originally, I moved to Wales um, 11 years ago, and for me, my gardening was in a sort of small back garden in, in Brighton, it was predominantly um, vertical gardening, but you know, for me, it was a way of um, providing such enjoyment and grounding with a sort of very stressful career running a couple of PR companies, but I wanted to move to Wales and part of the reason for wanting to do that was to make this my career, but it was also about becoming hardier as a person. You know, I was really adept at um, PowerPoint, but I wanted to learn to, to do all these things for myself to make, mend and do. And things like taking, um, taking I don't know, some old pallet wood and turning it into a potting bench. I'm, I'm, I wouldn't say that I'm great at carpentry, but I can do that. If I can do that, anyone can do that. And it does give you confidence. Yes. And I think of all these things, um, you know, making, making, um, making compost and seed saving, seed saving definitely up there in terms of building that confidence in, in you as a resilient gardener. Kim, you know, you talk even more than I do. <laughs> But I got all these lovely questions. Thank you. If I may, I just wanted to read this out, first of all, from Anne Hayden, who says, Hi, everyone. My name is Anne Hayden, and I have recently set up an organization called Your Planet Doctors. I'm a GP passionate about building sustainable communities with good mental health and know that community growing of food does exactly that. Also, it will safeguard against food insecurity, which we already have in many areas and will much more as our soil and climate deteriorate. Uh, thank you very much, Anne. That is uh, inspirational for all of us and yet another reason why, why the more of us who can kind of hang on to this kind of approach and, and uh, think about how we build resilience into ourselves and our garden. We will safeguard the planet and uh, we, we will get so many benefits from it. Now I need to get down to practical from Joy, if I may, Kim. Yeah. Uh, Joy lives in the countryside and she's got a big field along the side of my garden, which is not organic. She wants to know how to protect her garden. She's got a hedge and they planted trees, but is there any way you can protect garden from toxic sprays and are there particular plants that perhaps she could grow? I think that this is, um, a, this is the kind of fact of life. So I think this, this is a, a, a great question. That is a really good question. It's, um, I mean, where I live, my, my farming neighbors, neighbors don't, don't farm organically. Um, they look at um, my little plot of wildlife and probably think, you know, what's that? But, you know, they're you know, great people and everything. But, you know, there's a lot of pressure on the farming community to work in a certain way, um, which unfortunately, um, you know, does factor in sometimes use some of these chemicals. Um, there's lots of things that you can do. If you've got a lot of area to work with, um, you know, to provide that protection, hedging is great. 
but I would say um, look at other, other sort of plants and shrubs as well, just so you've got, again, that protection. The same way that you would look at um, if you have an area with strong winds, you want to provide, um, you know, like a multi-layered effect. So whether it's things like, um, you know, some trees, um, some shrubs as well, just so you're providing that protection and you don't know exactly what they're using. It might be worth also trying the personal approach and having a chat with them um, and just asking if there's anything they can do on their side um, to see whether they'd be open to um, providing some sort of um, wildlife area. You might be surprised actually, there's a lot of um, changes happening in the world of farming right now with, um, with Brexit and with everything else. It is worth trying to work with your neighbours and to have a conversation. You know, I mentioned before um, about the, um, the field at the back of my gardens that, um, you know, uh, basically was sort of ploughed over and it resulted in flooding, not just the field being ploughed over, but the rain. Um, they don't, they don't um, plough the field anymore, um, they just use it for grazing and that's because I had a chat with them and I appealed to their sensibility um, and I put it in a way that was attractive to them as well, I sort of bung them some veg every now and again, you know it's worth trying to harbour those relationships and you might find, you never know that during the course of having that conversation you might change their mind in some small way or plant a seed of change but I think we're very much this, this idea of we're all in this together and people are going to have different views about things, but it's worth trying that conversation. It's worth having a chat and seeing if you can convince them because they've probably got, you know, the, the fields that you're talking about, I imagine, are probably very large. So for them to create, you know, wildlife area within that, it's, you know, it's small scale. I mean, my neighbours have hundreds of acres. I have 2.3 um, so, you know, though that, that's that small scale in comparison, but yeah, conversations are worthwhile having to yeah. see if you can um, get any traction with that. Yeah, and conversations, I think, with one's fellow gardeners as well. We, we do yeah. all know very sadly uh, the amount of pesticides and fertilizers that are used in gardens. Um, I've, I've lived in my village for eight years. I'm just kind of beginning to get them to think twice about Roundup. But I mean, I, you know, they're kind of getting used to me now. So I, I think conversations also have to be part of the solution as well. Mm -hmm. Need to know your views on worm composting, please. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, yeah it seems... worm composting. Yeah, I've experimented with um, different things over the years um, because it fuels, you know, what the, the writing I do. Um, I feel that if I'm going to write about something, I need to try it and um, or to try the opposite of it, almost to, to see sort of why I'm writing about it. So I've tried, um, I've worked with a wormery before. Um, I've tried um, things like the cashew bins, um, you know, just to get a sense of um, why they, they're sort of quite popular. You know, the cashew bins are quite trendy for people. Um, living in you know sort of city flats and stuff like that but yeah I to be honest with you um, I would just recommend you just using bog standard compost um, compost um, pile or fashioned one I have four chamber composting system I use it so it touches the soil so um, it allows the um, the heroes of the compost patch you know that are sort of helping in the process to actually get in and what I do is I take um, a layer from the um, completed compost that's ready and I actually then lay it over the compost that's actually currently being activated as a way of helping to speed things up and reducing the amount of digging that I need to do. Um, the wormery side of things, um, I, I thought it was a great idea, but I just thought I'd rather just work with the compost part because it's full of worms anyway. I know you can do things like you can obviously get the fertilizer worm tea um, which I know people have done, but I try and minimise things as much as possible. I've done lots of things like um, comfrey tea, compost tea, those sorts of things. And whilst I can see they're beneficial, I just try and supercharge my compost pile as much as I can. Um, so I get things like seaweed from a local beach, I put in um, comfrey, um, you know, I keep chickens, so the bedding from the chickens, all those sorts of things, just to make that as potent as possible. But it, again, if something, you know, if, if you enjoy the idea of doing something and if it's a fun project for kids um, and it works well in the space that you have, it doesn't mean to say it's not a good thing to try. It's, it's very much about individual taste. 
If we, I can see very sadly where uh, time is running out on us, I, I can't stress again, if I may, there's the most wonderful chat going on. There is so much good advice and tips coming through. Thank you so much, everyone. It, it really is brilliant. Yeah. It really is. Uh, you know, Kim and I are both passionate that we are all in this together. And if we each do our little bit, we will get there. No doubt about it. I think it would be quite nice if you kind of, with the climate change garden thing, you couldn't give us a couple of uh, just kind of basic tips to round us off, to set us on this journey. We've talked a lot about the resilience and about the connection and about all being in it together. But as gardeners, we always want the practical tips. Got a kind of couple of practical tips. Yeah. I think. I think we can talk watering. Um, that's a big one. Um, with climate change during the summer months, um, again, let's think about sunshine. Um, it's um, that they can be the bane of the garden's life, you know, lots of toing and froing. And yeah. that's the thing, isn't it? It's the flip side of, yeah, it's really nice to have lots of sunshine. But when it's for a very long, prolonged period, then it's very challenging um, to, to the garden and the produce within. So with this, um, the main thing with that, I mean, things like mixed planting are, are actually very useful. But in terms of the watering tips, there's things that you can do um, that really help mitigate and reduce the amount of time that you need to spend. So the key things with that are that when you water, to water really deeply. So um, if you imagine and water at the right time of day, yeah. so you don't water, if you're watering in the middle of the day, with the, you know, the sort of glare of the sun, it's just going to evaporate away the, um, the water that you're applying, which is obviously wasteful. So early in the morning, later in the evening, some people have a preference for either. Personally, I don't think it matters. Um, it's cooler temperatures and you want to make sure that the water is actually getting into the ground. So if you water for longer um, and you water the soil, um, then the water will actually permeate, um, here's me being um, really animated again, um, you know, it will, it will permeate much deeper down into the soil where it can stay for longer. So that, that massively helps, that will reduce the amount of watering you need to do. If you also have a very um, compost rich soil, so the soil is incredibly important for everything with your plants, um, you know, for the, um, the resilience of your seedlings, um, the, the health and vitality, you know, the immune system almost of your plants. So if you have, um, you know, healthy, healthy soil, that's going to massively help not digging, again, improve soil structure, and that means the, water, the soil has a much greater ability to hold that water and to keep it in. If you then combine that um, with using the ground cover, Lindy said that you do that anywhere, which is brilliant. So not having that soil exposed. So you've got, here's, here's the soil, um, you know, the glare of the sun. And if the sun can actually, um, you know, if it, can, if it can reach the soil, it's gonna dry it out. It's gonna dry out a lot quicker. But if you have things, even, you know, filler plants, flowers, lots of things, even, um, you know, summer, summer squash, uh, winter squash, um, you know, massive, beautiful sprawling leaves, you know, around other plants. It's a way of providing protection for the soil. The other thing you can do as well to help reduce the amount of watering is if you know that heat wave is, um, is on its way, um, actually, for, it's not last year, but the year before, um, February 2019, Keradigian, it, where I live in West Wales, um, which is not what you imagine to be the hottest place in the UK, was actually the hottest place in the UK. I don't know if you remember, but we had um, the temperature went up into the 20s in February. So everyone got really excited and thought, oh wow, that's that's so loads of seeds. And then it got really cold afterwards. But you know, the thing with this is that um, basically, uh, so getting back to the point, I was getting a bit excited thinking about sunshine then again. But um, no, if you if you um, if you want to water the plants, so particularly water hungry plants like Mediterranean crops, the trick is that you can apply this, this deep watering technique and then a mulch. So then if you mulch over the surface and that can be compost, it could be, um, you know, you can use materials that you have to hand. It could be some leaf mold. Um, you know, you can even use things like wood chip if it's not directly against the, um, the actual plant stem itself. 
just to try and keep that moisture in that will help massively and I think it's good not to water too much because I think if you water too much then your plants can become quite needy so it's actually good to try and reduce the amount of watering to help them to, um, to become more resilient in themselves. So that's that's one thing I don't know if I've got time for something else I do talk a lot so <laughs> no, I, I love it I just can't get a word in edgeways and usually it's the other way around so this is really good for me <laughs> yes give us one more that would be great thank you and, and actually there's somebody here wants to know Anne wants to know how you process your chicken bedding oh yes um that's a good question it's um there's different things you can do with this. Um, I've, I've, you should imagine, I've sort of experimented quite a lot with um, I, the technique that's easiest for me is I use it as sort of mixed into the, the compost. So it's like a mixed, mixed open chamber compost pile, a uh, four chamber compost pile. So I would use that as a, um, a brown layer mixed into the compost pile. And you might have seen in garden centers, you can actually buy, um, I'm not quite sure if they're actually called chicken poo, um, but effectively it is, um, it's, so it's a compost accelerator. So it actually works really well to help to fuel the um, acceleration of the, the compost. You can also, um, I know people, smallholders that have tried um, keeping the, the, you know, using this bedding and actually using it on the ground to experiment with that, but it's very acidic on its own. Um, it would take quite a long time to, to really break down. So mixing it in, again, having that sort of balance with, um, with lots of other green ingredients, um, it's just a better way of working it. And it, I mean, if you've obviously got a lot of chickens, um, that wouldn't work. But if you have just a few chickens as part of a realistic size garden composting system, that works really well because it's not the main ingredient, it's all in balance with everything else. It's all about balance, isn't it? Uh, actually, if you do have room for even kind of three chickens, I, I think it uh, it's all part of the recycling. It's all part of that that whole kind of uh, self sustaining uh, cycle. And and talking about recycling, I never quite. What's your view on on night soil, otherwise known as urine, as a compost activator? Because some people whereby and other people don't and the reason why I ask the question is if we all need to think about mm. how we can bring minimum inputs in then actually using yeah. your own uh, urine to activate your compost uh, might be a good idea but some people yeah. think awesome. I actually um I you know I have I haven't tried that myself um but I think I should um I'm not going to go outside for a wee now though because it's too <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so I mean, actually, what generally happens you stick it in I know, the pot. I know, yeah no um I actually I was interviewing a um, gardening historian the other day um and she was talking about how um human waste was used throughout history um to to grow produce it was used for the fertility of the land so it's a really good question and actually with the sort of medieval um the moats they used to drain the moats every four years and they used to, to and people used to use that for, you know, for the sort of toilet. Um, and that would actually go onto the land. And then in a lot of um, cottages, they would have, they would have um, buckets or they would, you know, they would have, um, there's a term for it, I can't think what the term is, but effectively they would be taking it out and using it. And where she lives, she's got an old, um, you know, sort of medieval cottage, um, which sounds lovely. And she said the reason the ground was so fertile when they first moved there was because it had a long history of the chamber pot um, yeah. being used in that way. A lot of farmers, they, you know, if you get farmers that empty septic tanks, I don't think they're supposed to, but I, I'm kind of, I've heard that a lot of them do actually just put it on the land. I mean, there's issues with, you know, now with sort of health and safety with parabens and so forth, um, mm -hmm you know, around this, um, but yeah, it has been used. Um, compost toilets, obviously another good example. Yeah. So yeah, it's a good question. It is something that um, we, we should really be thinking about for the future. Uh, maybe. Yeah, funnily enough, Suella um, was saying, should we be careful about medication if we use human urine, which of course, as we all know, is called night soil, by the way, uh, which is what you've just been talking about. It, uh, I mean, I, I never use medication, so it wouldn't occur to me, but yes, I guess the answer to that is yes. 
It's a good point. And that maybe that's a barrier to this, because if you think about it in the past, you didn't have people on um, antidepressants or on the pill or all these other things that potentially are going into that supply. So does that have an impact? Um, and how does that work? And also plastics, we're ingesting a lot of plastics, yeah. unfortunately, um, in a myriad of different ways. So does that have an impact as well? Um, I don't know, but it's a, it's a really interesting question. If we're going to be looking at truly, um, you know, sort of self-sustaining, if we're looking at this for the future, should we be doing something else? It also depends on diet, probably as well, what you're eating. Um, there's probably that factor as well, isn't there? I think we'll get back onto a positive, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> I think you had one more tip up your sleeve. And, and then I, I, I think we probably better call, very sadly, a, a finish. Or, or is there anything you would quite like to round up with as we have you, Kim? I think just as much as possible, um, this idea of trying to work with the natural world is thing it relates to everything so it relates to trying to find um, time if you can to look at your garden and I have not been very good at this in the past it's when I first started teaching therapeutic gardening that I would be getting people to slow down and to connect I'd be doing lots of exercises where we'd um, pick things and look at them and um, you know now I use that across the board because we you know with the pandemic everybody actually needs this but it's um with, with the connection as well, it's sort of working with nature. We've still got this habit of growing things and then whipping them out the ground at the first opportunity and then putting something else in. But actually, there's quite a few things that we can leave in. Um, so, for example, if it's things like pick and come again lettuce. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can harvest it. Yeah. With herbs, you can, you can often keep doing that. And if you're not, then allowing it to flower. Um, you know, the flowers from a lot of um, veg produce um, and herbs are beautiful. You can use them, use them in food, you know, they're great for pollinators. So experimenting with things like that is actually very beneficial. I'd highly recommend the, the brassica idea um, as well. And then just trying to keep things in the ground as much as possible across the board, not pulling things out, allowing, allowing self-seeding, um, you know, you know obviously we've spoken about allowing weeds to grow but dandelions are amazing for pollinators early in the year you know i mean the you can use the you can use the um the stem can't you for to make coffee um there's lots of medicinal benefits a lot of medicinal benefits to a lot of these um these plants to weeds that we're just not really looking at things like plantain there's actually a, there's a lot there so i think just you know really it's about just not try, don't control it. You know, just try and hold back from the control. I interviewed um, Frances Tophill, um, I don't wish to like name check, but it's relevant to this, but I interviewed her for the Organic Way magazine in December. And she's written a book, um, it's, it's sort of all to do with like, you know, rewilding the outside space. And she was talking about there's a need for change um, yeah. and trying to, you know, to flip the switch. So, you know, that's someone who's mainstream talking about this. So. I really think that change is in the air. We can't continue as we have been. We can't, it's not sustainable. So we need to, we need to, to have that. Again, I'll say it one more time, I promise, connection. <laughs> Kim, thank you so much. And honestly, thank everybody for the most amazing uh, uh, chat. Uh, uh, really, it, it, it's so great to, uh, to be able to connect with you all in, in this way. I am actually going to give uh, a plug for Kim's uh, book because she does go through a lot of the basics and she also goes through the design elements and the this, that and the other. So if it has inspired you, I think you would really enjoy that book. It'll kind of get you on the track, so to speak. And Sally as well. Sally, who's here tonight as well. Um, we we wrote it together, yeah. Yes. Hello, Sally. Hello, Sally. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, I will give a wee plug. We're actually going to see, we're having a return visit down to Charles Dowding. 
So, um, and we, uh, we welcome uh, friends and, you know, friends of anyone who, who is in our club. We had a brilliant day last year and we're hoping to do that again. I think we've got a little thing on bronze tools up our sleeve as well. And Pesticide Action Network, we have mentioned pesticides. So Pesticide Action Network are going to run our next webinar. We're gonna have a, a pesticide primer so we can all find out about the awful neonics and, and stuff like that. But Kim, can't thank you enough. And thank you everyone for, uh, for, for coming and for joining in. Uh, and to Anne Hayden, and I see we've got all kinds of people connecting and, and uh, gonna form local groups and uh, joining up with Anne Hayden as well. So that's a brilliant result. Thank you all. Thank you. Hey, can I just end, Kim, yes, absolutely happy. amazing. Please, can we have you back? <laughs> And yeah. just to say, we, I've got a fantastic recording of the session and I will be sending everybody a link to the recording and, and the chat. We save all the chat as well, so you, we can all benefit from that. Um, I've just been blown away. I've got some old Victorian habits which have been taught to me, which you have, you have nicely swept out the window. So thank you very much. And thank you, everybody. You can go and enjoy your dinners now. Everyone's been really great. Yeah, we just need some of Jess's pomme dauphinoise. <laughs> oh, that sounds so nice. Oh, yes. <laughs> On that happy thought, we will say bye-bye until the next time. Thank Cheers. you so much, everybody, bye. and bye for now.